we now come, as I said, media in race of our scientific program and uh, host the uh, keynote speaker for today's evening and for these two days colloquium, uh, Professor Marion Korpmans. She is director of the um, World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam and studies in her uh, scientific research the uh, global population level impact of rapidly spreading emergence infectious diseases. Her research focuses on unraveling the modes of transmission of viruses among animals and between animals and humans. She is co-principal investigator in the PREPARE project aimed at building a pan-European operational network for rapid and large-scale European clinical research in response to infectious diseases uh, with epidemic potential. And she is the director of the uh, World Health Organization Collaborating Center for uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases, as I mentioned, scientific director of the Netherlands Center for One Health. Professor Kopmans is the recipient of the Stephen Premium 2018 and became a member of the Dutch Academy of Sciences in 12, in 2019. Professor Kopmans, it is a great pleasure to host you and I ask you to deliver your presentation. I know you have to leave. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, and it looks like I just pressed this button to uh, get at my uh, slides because uh, they already came by uh, shortly. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. <clears throat> and uh, I decided to title my talk, also given this, this forum, uh, Building the Ship While Sailing, because that really has been the experience of the past two years. And it also is a title that I have used, used for many years for teaching on emerging disease preparedness. Um, but it is still uh, remarkable how challenging it really is uh, once you get into to that situation. So the challenges of scientific advice during an emerging crisis. And this is a um, summary of sort of the competing priorities as I have sensed them and as I'm sure many people have sensed them. So there's a quote on top from the, the lead uh, of the, global, the WHO uh, emergency program, uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, say, saying, be fast, no regrets, you don't need to be right, just do. Very much an action-oriented uh, person uh, at the highest level of WHO. And that's a juxtaposed with an editorial in, human, <clears throat> in Nature Human Behavior, really putting out a strong plea for more uh, systematic evidence synthesis, meta-analysis, don't go by single publications because there's biases in there. Of course, you can already see the tensions between those two positions. And then there is uh, a scientist like <laughs> uh, Dr. Tony Fauci uh, finding himself also in this uh, science policy advice between the virus that he understands extremely well but also a politician who has some specific ideas, as is certainly the previous president. And this is sort of the environment that many uh, scientists in the emerging disease field have felt themselves in. So I would, what I will do is just walk you through some of the early steps, uh, the, the types of questions that uh, we know need to be answered and just the challenges that we experience there and see uh, what, what what comes from that. So this is my first encounter, a Twitter message. China is uh, very, very avid also on Twitter, was, I must say, uh, December 31st, 2019, and it, it was a, a, a message from a, a newspaper, a Chinese newspaper that had picked up a flyer from the Municipal Health Service of Wuhan that warned about weird cases of pneumonia. 
no uh, etiology, but there's something going on. And they put that on Twitter. So that's what I heard uh, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, essentially. And I think here's one of the really first key accomplishments uh, based on long-term investments into a certain capacity of doing uh, studies that allow you to unravel an unknown disease, uh, etiology of an unknown disease. Uh, because uh, within a week after that message, we heard of, we were already informed of a most likely etiology, and here, three weeks later, a preprint was shared uh, that really showed um, quite conclusive that indeed they had nailed down the etiology. So that in that preprint, there was uh, clear documentation of virus culture results. Um, it was clear that the, those cultures were really associated with the acute phase of symptoms here, uh, many positives and not in later stage disease. It was also clear that whatever this was, people were develop patients were developing an immune response to it. So beautiful, complete, uh, uh, evidence, this is a new virus, and it is really associated with the clinical syndrome that we see. Also included was the genomic information, which allowed us and, uh, to, to understand what we are looking at and saying, this is a coronavirus. Now, we know coronaviruses. There's a huge diversity of their uh, coronaviruses, and there's an expanding diversity. So as a scientist interested in these viruses, that's of course the first thing you do. You get a new sequence, you see where does it sit. And this virus sat in this complex uh, phylogenetic tree uh, right here, where it, from the uh, icons you can already see uh, a part of the taxonomy that it shares with bat viruses. And the reason we know those viruses are there is from studies that have been done following the SARS outbreak in 2003. So investments in ecology studies that had identified all of these SARS-like viruses which, to which uh, the closest uh, match was with this new virus. Now if you have a genome, uh, you can also make diagnostic assays. You can make PCRs. And this, again, was done, uh, was, was quite uh, successful through, again, prior investments in research collaborations. Um, there's a couple of collaborative networks in Europe uh, of scientists that, uh, that do emerging disease diagnostics. So in that network, uh, the first weeks of January uh, 2020, uh, PCRs were designed. Um, those reagents were shipped to a couple of labs that had patient specimens uh, from patients with all sorts of respiratory disease, including MERS and including SARS, to validate those initial tests. So by the second week, by, by January 17th, the first protocols were available. They were shared through the WHO and they were used to prepare kits for diagnosis uh, of this virus in countries that cannot build these assays by themselves. Um, um, so to, WHO shipped 250,000 kits to the most likely places in Africa that were going to receive the first patients. So this all uh, quite prepared from the preparedness networks that had been in place, that had been funded. Um, now, if you see, so the initial uh, data that was shared really strongly suggested uh, this is most likely an animal virus that has jumped species. Um, and that's what we look at. This is a, an image that is used in, uh, to grade zoonotic disease. So you have a spillover uh, of an infection that, that comes from an animal reservoir. Uh, and the impact of that is going to be depend very much on what, the, what happens after that. So a spillover can dead end very much. Think, for instance, about rabies. Um, very, it's a lethal disease, uh, but it doesn't spread easily between people. So the bug stops at, at one round of replication here. But of course, what we worry about is viruses that, that, that have or acquire the capacity to continue to spread between people because that's 
what leads to expansion. So the, the, really the key set of questions that we have with any spillover is always the same. Uh, what is it? Uh, how can I detect it? That's of course what you need to be able to address these questions. Uh, what is the reservoir? Who can be infected? Uh, how can people be infected? How widespread is it? How contagious is it? How severe is the disease? Who is most at risk? And how can it be stopped? It's just a simple shopping list of questions we always have. Whether it's Ebola, Zika, or the new coronavirus. Now here, um, of course, you then start to see studies and pieces of information, and very early on, there already was the, the, the bad hypothesis, but looking at the genetic data, the genetic information, and uh, using uh, information from evolutionary virology, it was clear that there was a gap in, of, of uh, several decades between the b best uh, matching bad viruses and this new virus. So something missing. Could be uh, virus presence in, in other bats, unsampled bats. Could also be virus present in other species. So from one of the surveys, these uh, animals came out, pangolin, critically endangered, in, endangered but also uh, favored, favorite food item, dangerous combination. So those animals are really uh, brought into China uh, from an increasingly wide geographic region through holding facilities, and that's really, if you want to do an infection experiment, that's how you do it. Um, so, and there's also uh, an increasing list of other animals that we know can, uh, can have these viruses. A uh, critical question, of course, immediately if you think about how do you stop, stop this thing, you really need to know how it spreads. And as easy as that question is, it's extremely difficult to really nail down with certainty, evidence-based. Um, and uh, so, of course, from the clinical presentation, pneumonia, coughing, you can easily say, okay, this must be respiratory, there must be droplets involved. Um, and the classical public health thinking is uh, usually it's big droplets. So social distancing in one and a half to two meters, that's your key public health measure. But we've seen massive debate when this uh, became bigger and bigger and very different fields started to move in that said, hey, hang on, but we know about particles, particle physics, dispersal, ventilation, drafts, building, how come you say this is not other types of airborne transmission? Very, very challenging debates because this would completely change the key public health measures and recommendations and it was very difficult to find the evidence for it. But uh, I'm sure every country has had that debate uh, very hotly. Questions also, what about shedding in stool? Um, that may seem trivial, but we know that viruses that are shed through stool end up in the food chain. Sorry, but that happens. Um, so that would bring in other ways of transmission. And the same applies for uh, contact surfaces. Can these viruses stay infectious when on a doorknob? Or, and that's where, of course, the, hand, the rigorous hand was washing recommendations come from. So um, early on in any disease outbreak, there's a whole bunch of experiments that is done. This is a type of experiment that uh, we have expertise in, and it's trying to address some of these questions in, in this kind, in this uh, example, animal uh, experiments. So this is ferret infection in experiments. It's a gamble. You don't know if these animals will be susceptible, but in this case they were. And what you then do is you infect an, a, a ferret. You see if it really gets the infection, and that happened. You add an, a contact animal. You see if that animal also gets infected, so there's direct contact transmission. And then you put an animal in a cage uh, further away where only air contact is possible, and that's your check for is there airborne transmission. Uh, so very simple uh, experiment, in fact, that gives you a lot of information early on, especially 
since this has been done for SARS, for MERS, for influenza, so you can get comparative first impressions. So this was really the decisive uh, experiment that said March 2020, yes, aerosol transmission, and yes, very similar respiratory symptoms or uh, uh, pathology as we have seen in MERS and in SARS, severe pneumonia. Uh, back to China. So now, many of those questions on how contagious is this virus need to come from local intelligence, need to come from local public health studies and epidemiological studies. Uh, and this is the, f the earliest uh, uh, data from China. So here we have this, this newspaper alert. And here you see uh, for a couple of days, well, there was something like 80 suspected cases, severe pneumonia. That's, that's, the numbers didn't really increase. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism across the world on why don't they know, why don't they do this? But I think it's really important to recognize that in any hospital all over the world, for the vast majority of people with pneumonia will not get a diagnosis on the cause of that pneumonia. Very often it is, don't know, treat it. If, it's, if it responds to antibiotics, it's probably bacterial. Uh, and otherwise, we don't know. So it's really not strange, this. Um, and what you can see is by the time that the virus had been identified and assays were available, you see the numbers decrease because then you can actually rule out some cases. And by the time China CDC then distributed those diagnostic kits through the states, you saw the numbers go up. Now that of course is a bit of a worry. If you see that the case counts follow where the diagnostic kits go, then you know for sure that things are being missed, but just how much you miss, very difficult to know. Um, because this is the typical, uh, this is the disease pyramid. Um, and again, this is what you need to know, how many people ha that are infected have no symptoms and do they spread? How many have mild symptoms? How many have severe symptoms? And the shape of this pyramid, of course, is very much uh, determining the severity. Think of Ebola, where, so that's, that's, that's shown here. So this is more than half of all cases will have extremely severe disease or maybe even die. In rabies, everyone dies. In uh, this virus, we event eventually know that only the tip of the pyramid dies. Uh, but understanding how that pyramid looks is extremely difficult early on in an in a, uh, outbreak or a pandemic because you don't have the, the widespread diagnostics that you need. Um, symptoms are not specific. Um, generally, people with mild symptoms do not go to a doctor, so you wouldn't see them at all. And it does require pre-designed studies, pre-positioned studies that are rapidly deployable. Now, if uh, anyone here that, that deals with medical ethical clearing of studies and with GDPR issues knows rapidly deployable and clinical studies are very uh, difficult to reconcile. Very, very challenging this. So the timeline here is rather months than, than, than weeks, than the weeks that you really would need. And why is this so important? Well, because of what I just explained. So, a, foreseeable impact, which is what you really want to prepare for, really depends on understanding uh, the, the transmissibility, but also the severity, because the combination is what de determines the impact. So um, seeing that here, um, this is the uncertainty of the month of January when we really were dependent on, in, uh, on local intelligence from China. Um, and here in uh, one of the WHO emergency committee meetings that I attended, attended uh, there were detailed uh, reports on the household surveys that they had been doing over 700 uh, uh, people uh, um, accessed contacts of these household members of these uh, cases, and very few secondary cases. But with the case definition that they then used, 
and because that's what was known, pneumonia, not the mild snotty noses that we later recognized were part of the spectrum. Uh, but in the same time, we started to see a traveler here and there. Um, and that, of course, is odd. If you just have a handful of cases and you already see a couple of travelers, that doesn't mix. So just from statistical inference, the Imperial College of London said, hang on, this cannot be right. There must be many, many, many infections that are being missed. And that's, uh, but you don't know for sure. Difficult to, to bring in. So this is one of the key questions. Could the pandemic had been prevented? It's a question I get a lot. I think that's the question that you need to uh, answer here then is, could we have recommended to block the European seeding? Because that's what happened. Uh, late January, early February, the big seeding events in Europe were winter sports and carnival, so big gatherings. And uh, by the time uh, these were happening, and we had the discussions in our country, all of Europe, so, so the whole WHO, so that's extended Europe, had 47 recognized cases. So would you have been able to recommend block all uh, holiday traffic, block all large-scale gatherings? I don't think that's possible. In, in pandemic theory, yes. Uh, we could have stopped it. If the whole world had gone in lockdown, we could have stopped it. But I think that's a very theoretical concept. Uh, what was really <clears throat> uh, breakthrough in this pandemic was the coming of age of genomics. Just uh, the sh the, this had been, well, sort of played with. Uh, I myself had a couple of uh, grants on on using virus genomics, but I really had to talk up a storm to, to actually convince people to use it. But this became mainstream. Every, now, every person on the planet nowadays asks, which variant is it? Has it sequ been sequenced already? You know, the incredible shift in uh, the technology. Uh, and of course, very powerful, because you, you can derive a lot of information from uh, genomic uh, sequences. Um, there's, there's things you can learn just from the virus itself. Do you have specific mutations? What does it tell you about the pos possible functions? What are the relationships? And then if you add in uh, some uh, epidemiological data, you can also start to ask questions about who infected whom? Uh, what, what exactly is going on if I see a cluster? Are they, are they all related or are they separate introductions? And that matters if you have to uh, uh, design control measures. So this is an example, that, which is really my pandemic image um, for me. Uh, so this is a result of a genomic analysis of viruses that, were, uh, that, that, that we found through a screening exercise in the week after the first Dutch patient was recognized. So then we had this southern region uh, of the Netherlands, which had had this carnival, which in, and in that period, everyone has a cold. Anyone who has done carnival has a cold. Um, but they said, well, maybe uh, this virus is, is circulating there. So there was this big screening effort one weekend, 1,000 healthcare workers, and sure enough, 4 to 5% of them were already infected, carrying the virus. And this was the, the virus tree. These were all the viruses globally sequenced. And as you can see, we had viruses all over the tree. So massive missed transmissions. So that immediately told us, oh, OK, the way we are currently doing the detection case finding doesn't work. We are missing massive circulation. And that's been a, a decisive piece of evidence to say, lockdown immediately, <laughs> um, it was convincing. So what really has been great is the sharing of the genomic data and the infrastructures that were put in place. On the one hand, these are dedicated platforms, that's GizAid, um, and that's there because people trust it, it's, so it's not entirely open. Uh, you cannot just, just get all the data and do uh, whatever you want with it. Uh, you have to sign up uh, and, and get approval. 
but there's also the EU open data portal, um, and some people put it in one, some in the other, and we're trying to really encourage people to put the raw data in the open portal for reuse. Um, what, however, is not being shared, uh, not nearly as well, is the public health data and the clinical data, so the metadata that really can also be very valuable in trying to mine genomic data for other questions. And that's something that uh, I think we really, and I, I, you know, it is a topic that came up already several times. Um, because one of the things that I felt, I found frustrating personally is that despite all these European preparedness networks that were in place, clinical, laboratory, um, once every, every country, once they got one patient, went totally national and started to work with, started to build their own networks from scratch uh, instead of building on this infrastructure that was in place, in which case I think we could have moved faster. Um, so that created also a problem because everyone started to use or implement their own case definitions, testing algorithms. Um, so you got, and the data were reported, but how to compare the data became increasingly difficult. Um, and that uh, can be seen also uh, here looking at the reported number of tests, which um, here you see a small, a small peak, which was the spring peak, you know, X number of cases, a huge number of deaths. Um, and of course that ratio changed when more testing became available and the testing criteria became broader. Uh, and so, but, but reading what the actual numbers mean for the different countries is really difficult. So we've seen all this, I don't know, in, in, in newspapers, in media, the, oh, Germany is doing so much better than the Netherlands, than Belgium, then I think we have to be very careful to draw those conclusions just from the raw data analysis that needs rigorous analysis. One of the big... Uh, well, the virus factors, of course, has been its evolution. Uh, viruses do that, um, although I must say uh, we were a little bit surprised by how fast that evolution went for this virus. So the development over time of variants that really v were uh, increased very rapidly in transmissibility. And there's been big debates about the origin of this virus, wasn't it already from the lab because it was human adapted, and this is for me one of the, one of the arguments for saying, well, it certainly wasn't optimal because look at how this virus has been adapting uh, to human circulation. Um, fortunate, and it was mentioned, is of course the extreme success of the vaccination, and it was extreme. We had been discussing uh, the bar for using a vaccine if it had an efficacy of over 50%, because that already could make a big dent in, in you know, would be still a quite, a, quite a useful tool to have. Uh, but the vaccine efficacy here, just from the first generation mRNA vaccines, was much higher than that, over 90%, even in elderly, and it was, uh, it was uh, really unbelievable. Also, if you see the time it took to develop it compared to the timelines for some other infectious disease vaccines. Incredible, and we have been incredibly lucky with that <laughs> and need to invest to, uh, to make sure that that continues, I think. And then there's a, a whole plethora of questions that have been coming along the way. Each have their, their own scientific fields, uh, are very complex, uh, because studying virus infections is a complex uh, issue. You have the virus to, to, to well, to worry about. Uh, we've seen uh, interactions between uh, the viruses from, from human spillbacks into animals in our country, into mink, for instance, and then back into humans again with some evolutionary changes on the way. And you get the question immediately, oh, uh, does that do something to the virus? I don't know. <laughs> very very uh, often questions like that. Infection biology, who gets sick, why, based on what pathogenesis, 
And is there a virus factor? Is it different for different variants? How much does immunity matter? All of those questions. The complexity of uh, transmission questions, um, all of this. Uh, and the, the, the issue here was this, this was a explosion of studies globally and an explosion of papers all put out in preprints picked up by an explosion of media <laughs> where as a scientist in a scientific advisory role you try to you know see keep up see what is the good papers what do they really tell us how do we use this evidence i think that's a new science actually how to do that um, and we are discussing now with machine learners whether they could help us maybe sieve through that preprints to fish out the higher quality ones uh, maybe because it's it's extremely difficult so key successes i already uh, mentioned those particularly also uh, recognizing that um, there had been foresight to invest in some of this. There was the WHO blueprint program that said this was developed after the Ebola in West Africa, and they said, it's clear we're not ready. Uh, we have to make sure that there is programs that focus on, for instance, vaccines for these diseases that no one is interested in. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, CEPI was a funding, big funding uh, program that also uh, actually invested in that. But there were also some key challenges. Um, and so uh, one of the biggest, I think, is just how fragmented the response eventually uh, was. Every country on their own, uh, within a country, every scientist on their own, a lot of that. Uh, n limited connection between public health, clinical research, academia, um, and I've been, uh, uh, I'm an advisor to the Globet R, which is a network of global funders. Um, so in, by mid-2021, they had uh, collaboratively funded more than 10,000 research projects all over the world to address the 10 key questions. And we were all struggling in meeting after meeting to get the data combined because there was no common data infrastructure, there were no standards. So it's really not a good mechanism, I think. Um, yes, research and bottom-up research needs to thrive, but I think this was very much over the top. Market failure, so there were actual big shortages of lab, lab tests, of ICU equipment, which, which also impacted, we had to block, stop, all our other research um, to have reagents to do diagnostics. Um, and people don't recognize that. There's a, this discussion that, well, it's these people that just didn't want to scale up. There really were shortages. The, a key piece of equipment was made in Wuhan. Sorry, no shipments. Another key piece, the, the, the cotton tips for all of Europe were made in Northern Italy problem. So those kinds of issues. Um, there's been a lot of debate about the role and importance of so social science, and I do think it's, that's clear and critical, but there's also, it's also clear that the social sciences ha did not have a mechanism for, for pandemic preparedness. That needs to be developed. Uh, the infodemic, the politicized discussions, and the threats to scientists, of which I have been a recipient. <laughs> um, but I think the biggest problem has been also the global inequity. Um, so this is the uh, projected map of when, by when countries will reach the bar that was set for uh, vaccine coverage, uh, over 70% of the highest risk groups. And you can see there's a big global divide in this. Uh, which is very short-sighted because it's a bit like this cartoon. Um, it is coming back to bite us. Right now, one of the key hypotheses of uh, new variants is that they come from either undersampled populations or, uh, for instance, the large untreated HIV uh, cohorts that cannot clear infections, so they become well, permanently infected or long-term infected, in which case you see the viruses uh, accumulate mutations and change. And what, that's one of the 
the, the key hypothesis now, now for why we see one Omicron variant after the other coming out of some common source. And this is one of the ideas there. So yes, it was mentioned, I fully agree, we really need to start looking at this as a true complexity problem with a true integration of many different thoughts, areas of thinking, but please in peacetime, <laughs> so that we, are, that we know how to work together. Um, I, I'm not saying this pandemic is over, mind you, but, um, but that we, we do not, uh, you know, it's very difficult to figure this out in the middle of a crisis. You really have to prepare for it in peacetime. And I think, um, I, I maybe, uh, I don't know if, if there are examples, but so far I don't think um, this exists a lot, uh, this type of ecosystem. And we are trying to build that now uh, also in our uh, country. So I think these are still two uh, quotes that strike me. Um, uh, very true, every day is a brand new day with this pandemic, and that's true today. We don't know what the South African variants will do. We don't know if we will have a summer wave. We don't know how severe that will be. Uh, we don't know if we will have to go back into some type of uh, containment. Um, and this one is a, a, a journalist who, who has been awarded because of his COVID uh, writings and says, we all long to go back to normal, but normal led to this. And that I find a very, um, you know, that, that's close to my heart because I do think we have to be more forward looking and start thinking about, okay, can we really get at the core of prevention or at least earliest possible detection by looking at where these pandemics arise and the majority of new diseases in humans come from the animal world. They percolate somewhere happily, um, and then, but we start to worry about them and working on them once people get sick, and then you're inevitably too late. So can we somehow come up with a true preparedness program that doesn't put humans central, but that puts the whole ecosystem in which these diseases can evolve, in part because of human impact and pressures, can we put that central and, and get smarter about where do we, where, where are the risks increasing and how can we detect those? And that's um, something I'm very much interested in. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to of course, think that all of this is not possible without uh, funding, the funding landscape, and writing grants uh, in the middle of doing a COVID pandemic is no fun. <laughs> uh, so the whole thinking about, uh, so that I found that striking with, with the introduction uh, here, we have to go back to thinking about science in longer term, uh, themes and not this market situation with grant writing in the middle of a crisis. So that that hit home with me as well. Thank you very much, Marion, Professor Kopmans, for uh, this presentation. In fact, we had foreseen a, a question and answers period. However, for two reasons, I think that we will now not have this question. And there is a in my opinion, more important reason. And the less important reason is that our time is up. But that is not really the true reason. The true reason is for what you said, Marion, because it was such a complete presentation in terms also of this balance and dialectic between how science works, how society slash uh, policymakers expect science to work, that there's actually no real, any, any uh, deepening of uh, your discussion would in fact lead us into the discussion of the topics we are going to discuss tomorrow at the, uh, at the um, uh, sequence of the conference. So thank you very, very much for an extremely enlightening introduction to the symposium. I would now like to thank all participants, uh, past and future 
so the, uh, the, to this symposium. I would like to invite you all to the marble room um, upstairs for uh, a uh, so small symposium in the etymological sense, not in the translational sense that we use it. And I do hope to see you all tomorrow for the conference, the sequel of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>